you got to know where this guy at at all times. There he is again. How about three in a row? Oh, going to That was cold blooded. No! No! It's Saturday morning, June 4th. This is High Volume Shooter. So here we are sitting in between game one and game two. What are the adjustments that we're going to see? I think we're going to see the Celtics switch more. They did it quite a bit more in the second half of game one. It should play into Jordan Poole's hands. Getting a bigger body in front of him in space where he should be able to do his thing. You know, he, I, I don't think anybody's too surprised that he struggled in game one of the finals because he, outside of the core four, I'm adding Looney to that, he probably had the most pressure and expectations on him. And you could argue it's Wiggins. I think Wiggins is is far more experienced than Jordan Poole, even though not on this stage. Like, he's just played a lot more basketball, and, and he's, just, he's just more of a veteran, right? So Poole understandably had the most pressure out of the young guys on the team. And then you see what you see with him is his speed and his quickness. It's his greatest asset, but it also hurts him. He gets down into the paint so quickly and with so much velocity at times, he doesn't have time to make reads and kind of see the, f the floor properly. Where, like, as opposed to a Luka Doncic, right, where he comes rumbling and stumbling into the paint at, you know, 25 miles per hour. He's in a school zone. Not only does he have the size to see the floor, but he has the time because he's not flying in there so fast. But besides the switching, I think that we're also going to see Al Horford and Rob Williams show higher, try to get even and higher with the screens, which makes it paramount that Draymond, Loon, Otto has to roll with some intention. Or if it's Otto, Pop, you can't just sit there and like Looney will is probably the... Ah, uh, no, Loon, Loon's been getting it done offensively, right? Looney has, had, has added a lot, right? But, you know, both Looney and Draymond at times, they'll just kind of hang the screen and even hang around to reset it. And Draymond will just stand and watch. No, you got to go get somewhere. You can't just, like, set the screen and then just stand there and, and hope that Steph is a magician because they have to be prepared for their bigs to be showing and stepping up higher and taking that away. For Steph, what that means is pocket pass, baby bounce pass. We're, we're going to see that over the head hook pass. We can't let that turn into a bunch of turnovers, not against this defense. Offensively for Boston, you imagine they're going to be like, all right, well, we're going to get Tatum going. It's a funny kind of like rock, paper, scissors thing here because you know Tatum is going to come out with this mentality like, all right, I'm not having another stinker like that, right? Like I need a 30 piece, right? And so do you play into his hands because the conventional wisdom, I think, from Warrior fans and, and people just following the series is, is like, all right, well, you can't pay that much attention to Tatum. You can't treat him like Luka. He had 13 assists and every other Celtic hit multiple threes. They sprayed the block. So, you know, I said it myself in the breakdown, like, hey, you, you got to kind of dare Tatum to score more, right? We know he's capable. At the same time, the context coming into this game too, it kind of plays into his hand into his hands because you already know he's going to be looking to be more aggressive for his own. But what Boston likes to do is they love to get the off ball switch on Tatum at the elbow, whether it's Steph, Poole, whoever's in there, whatever switch they want to get. But uh, I would say, despite understanding that Tatum's probably going to be more aggressive looking for his own shot. Let's see if he gets going first, right? Before, again, you start treating him like Luka. Especially when he gets someone on the block with his back to the basket or on that high elbow. I don't think he's as, that good at taking advantage of his size with his back to the basket. Now, when he's faced up, right, that's when he's at his best at the top. It's a cat and mouse game, right? And, and so, yeah, there's times where you got to be extra aggressive and send the help if he's going. But at times, like, let, let's see if he can score, man. You know, it, it's going to be a balancing act as far as, the others, and, and Al Horford and his shooting in particular, uh, Marcus Smart, these, these guys, Derek White, that are spot-up weak side shooters. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's levels to contests and closeouts. It can become very nuanced. Now, people, I, I put out the Draymond clip, right? And, and some people are going to say, well, that's the game plan. That's the game plan. To an extent, right? On paper, it, 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 I would assume the game plan was, hey, you can't sell out 
on you're not going to they're not a, these other guys aren't good enough shooters where you come flying and sell out and leave your feet fine but there is a huge difference between stunting out or starting to head out and just standing and daring a guy to shoot now you turn mediocre shooters into good shooters and good shooters into great shooters if you don't give them anything to think about on the closeout you're making them a lot more efficient as shooters and that's what you saw with Boston, and Boston knew it from the start. It's an institutional problem with the Warriors, a philosophical problem. We've seen it all year. They overhelp down into the paint, and they don't get out to shooters in time. It drives. It's it's so funny to me when you watch that weak side corner guy rotate. They almost flip and turn around in shock that they got to get back out to that corner sometimes. Oh my! Hold! Oh, wait! Hold on! I got to get back out. When your whole strategy should actually be like, let me make it look like I'm helping in the paint, but I'm really super ready to get to close out to that corner shot. And it seems like it's almost in reverse with the Warriors. And so, look, I have no doubt that the game plan, the strategy was for Draymond to probably not over, not come flying out at Al Horford and stuff like that, right? But you got a short closeout, at least put some sort of hesitation in his thought process. He's out there seaming up on the ball. <laughs> you saw the results. And then what happens is by the time the Warriors made an adjustment and they were trying to get out to these guys in the second half, it was too late. They were hot, right? Derek White turned into the fucking third splash brother. What I'd like to see more from the Warriors, again, the offense wasn't really the problem in the first game, in my opinion. Now Steph bailed us out with those six threes. I don't think he's going to have as much airspace on the perimeter. So again, we're going to have to be able to finish at the rim because Boston obviously is going to be like, all right, well, we can't let them get that many open looks, Steph in particular. So guys are going to have to roll and be willing to challenge the Time Lord, get into his body. When you're dealing with the shot blocker of his caliber, you don't drive at him trying to finish. You drive at him trying to get the foul. You go right into his body and hold on to the ball until the last possible second before you come back down and then flip it up. Give the ref time to blow the whistle. That That's what I would tell these guys getting downhill with him coming over. Al Horford, as good as he is with his timing, he's not, you know, is he 6'9"? He doesn't get off the floor that quickly. You saw Wiggins go right at his chest. I think Horford, you could go right at him and try to finish. Not saying you're going to win it every time, but with the Time Lord, again, you just got to go find his body. I would jump. If he's coming over from the weak side and he's trying to meet you at the basket, I'm jumping into his body as opposed to jumping towards the hoop. I know easier said than done. But I would like to see Wiggs get some more touches. You know how throughout the season they they like to put him on that block where he can turn left shoulder with the little jump hook. And if he's going to get Derek White if they're going to play Peyton Pritchard out there, um, I think that that's an area that we can look to attack when the game slow down in the half court. I think one of the bigger questions that Dub Nation has, though, is going to be how long does Steve Kerr stay with Andre and Jordan Poole? And I already talked about Jordan. Look, you, you got to – Jordan, I think you could make the argument like, look, we're going to need him. He's too big a part of what they do – night in and night out, you can't, you're going to have to let him push through and figure it out. Andre, obviously we haven't seen in months. And I thought when you consider that, he looked all right. He looked all right. My guy, Julian, he made a great point uh, on the patron in the comments. He said, he feels like this is Iguodala's Han Solo moment where Kerr, who's Yoda, tells him to give a look at the young Obi-Wans on the bench. And what, how I'm interpreting that is, Like, it may take Andre to say, hey, nah, like, I'm not feeling good. Like, right? Like, what will it take for for, for Moody to get Andre's minutes or Kaminga or Kerr to go someone else? It may take Andre selflessly saying, hey, man, like, I don't know if I can help. But, you know, they, they threw him out there. I thought it was a good sign he was willing to take the perimeter shot and... They're going to ride or die with Andre and that experience. And and he should only get better. Again, if he's comfortable taking the perimeter shot, his length and anticipation defensively, it'll always be there. It doesn't matter if he's missed six months. Now, I'm less optimistic about GP2. I think we all expected to see him in that game one, right? And I think the question is, like, what's the difference between playing Thursday and Sunday? Is 
two or three days going to make that much difference? It, it kind of makes you wonder, right? My guess would be he's not comfortable shooting that corner three yet, right? And they know if they put him out there and Boston sees that, then it's going to be tough to play him, right? Because you're probably going to have Draymond or Looney or somebody else out there who's a non-shooter. And so they're probably trying to buy him more time, more reps shooting that three. So at least he feels comfortable taking it. Now, going into this, I thought Grant Williams would be the X factor for Boston because, again, I presume that they're going to eventually go small here. And I, I I don't know. We'll see. Look, look, here's here's the thing. As I said, like, Al, I thought, you know, he might get played off the floor, but they didn't have to take him off because he was matching Steph with threes, right? Steph had seven, Al had six. Look, if they don't give up those threes to Al, you're looking at that game and you're like, dude, he he was giving them up. Like, they he probably got to get him out of there. But if he's matching him on the other end, so, but here was the thing. It wasn't Grant Williams as part of their small lineup. It was Peyton Pritchard. And, you know, Pritchard moves very good laterally and he plays, he defends the perimeter well, right? You look at him, you're like, all right, he's 6'1", but he's stout. He moves quick laterally, doesn't make mistakes. I think if they're going to play Pritchard, that opens up the door for perhaps some Moses Moody minutes because I think it would allow Mood to duck in on that baseline and kind of big boy him in a way that Poole can't do and in a way that Andre just, that's just not his style, right? You know, Moody is kind of a, a corner baseline specialist at this stage. And he, he has that big power hop. He plays bigger than you think at the rim. And I think Moody just hitting the offensive glass. And I think he could take advantage of Peyton's size better than those other two. And, and that might open the door for him. But again, it it may take Andre. It, it's going to be up to how he feels. If he's feeling good, you can expect Kerr to ride with the OG. So we'll see how it goes here. You know, I know that a lot of people want to remain optimistic there's always the don't panic crowd. And then there's the crowd that's like, oh my God, it's up, right? And then you got to try to be level-headed. Listen, of course the Warriors can still win the series, but I think stealing game one, regardless of quote, how lucky it was, they still did it. And so now I think what it's done is it's flipped the odds. Boston now becomes the favorite. They've stolen home court. They've stolen confidence or the Warriors have given them confidence. And so yeah, of course the Warriors could get it done, but now it's much more of an uphill battle. Now, I haven't had the chance to give my closing thoughts on the Miami Heat season after that Celtic series going seven. First off, why does Kyle Lowry wear his shorts like a 40-year-old white dude who wears do-rags? He got the... <laughs> all right, I'm going to leave Lowry alone. I'm going to leave him alone. But in all seriousness, I think... If I'm a Heat fan or, you know, around that organization, it's time to reevaluate the, quote, Heat culture. Because when you look at how they like to build their roster, it's full of grizzled vets. They, you know, Pat, they believe in veterans. And then the mentality of all gas, no breaks, no days off, right? And that's kind of counterintuitive. When you want to go out there and get 34, 35, 36 year old players, I think the Heat have to find ways to work smarter, not harder throughout the season. I get that that's part of the mentality and toughness is the grind, but they're going to, they're going to have to rebalance it out, especially with their infatuation with older players. Because we see it every year the roster breaks down in the playoffs. It's not a coincidence, it's Heat culture. As for Jimmy, you know, in the shot, should he have taken the shot? It was funny because he ended the season on the most un-Jimmy shot ever, right? Like Jimmy, that's his thing. Like, I ain't going to shoot threes. I'm going to be efficient. I'm going to bang into you. But you know the saying, fatigue makes cowards of us all. That's what it is. Like, I'm not faulting him for it again, but it was very un-Jimmy-like to take that shot. But considering what he had done throughout the series and where they were at, that's why he took it, right? It, the fatigue. Fatigue is why he took the shot ultimately. Speaking of heat culture and what Jimmy did in that series, as admirable as it was, that just took some time off his career. If Jimmy had three good years left at an all-star level, he probably has two now. Like there was a cost to that. That said, 
Jimmy Butler's a legend. He's a legend. Is he a legend like Wilt or Jordan or, or you know, or, or Kareem? No, of course not. But he's a legend in the sense of if you look at his career, he has created several legendary moments, stories that will be told about this era of hoop. Like, did you see Jimmy when he did this? Did you do the, the minute practice? Like, he's low-key a legend. Now, Bam, I know he showed up in that game seven and when was it game three? But for the majority of the playoffs, Bam looked like the Nigerian Adonal foil. Man, like Bam for Aiton, who says no? And I did want to speak about that Aiton situation briefly here. Apparently, Monty Williams doesn't really fuck with him. That, that's what they say around here in, in the valley, in the desert. Monty, he never really liked Aiton. And what I think happened, reading between the lines is, all year, Monty, Chris Paul, and Book patted him on the back, built him up, and probably bit their tongue at times, like knowing Aiton's, he's kind of sensitive, he's soft. Like, we got to build this guy up because we're going to need him. We're going to need him if we want to win the chip, right? Super patient with him. And then when push came to shove, and they needed him in that game seven, he didn't show up. And so, again, there was a report that he got into it with Monty Williams in the locker room. What I'm guessing happened is Monty took the mask off. Monty probably did a 180 on his ass in that, that locker room at halftime of game seven. Like, listen here, you soft-ass bitch. You know what I'm saying? He probably was like, enough's enough. I've been coddling you for two years, and you ain't gonna show up? <laughs> That's what I think happened. But, you know, the Suns are in a real bind here because obviously you can't let him walk. But I don't think you can find anyone who feels good about giving him a max, right? Like someone may poison pills, send him a Detroit. There's teams that could do it, but max him? Come on now. Like we, no. Nah. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of intriguing stuff over the summer, and, and including depending on what happens in these NBA finals. Lakers have hired Darvin Ham. I love that so many black coaches are getting opportunities now. Half half the coaches in the league are black. You know, that's a that's a crazy stat. It doesn't feel that way. Um actually a little more if you consider Nurse. You know, Nurse has got the hood pass. But no, um, no, but I think what you're seeing is teams, it started in Phoenix with Monty. And what he's done, and you look Willie Green, his disciple in New Orleans, and I think that that's becoming the new blueprint right now where organizations are kind of realizing for this generation of player, the disconnect between them and some 60-year-old white dude, it ain't it. That's important, right? A guy can know all the X's and O's and have a, a very impressive resume, but can you connect with these young kids? And so I think the teams are valuing that more, and then these dudes are showing up doing their due diligence and, and being buttoned up. And it's just a real good look for the league. It is. And I looked at Darvin Ham and I, I, I'll tell you what, Darvin, time has been kind to Darvin Ham. It really has because in his playing days, he was a top five ugly motherfucker. Bouncy motherfucker. Could jump out the gym, but he was an ugly son of a... Um, and so time has done him well, a beard aging and all that. But uh, we'll see how it goes. It's, it's uh, quite the first opportunity right you know um sprinkled in between that news for the lakers was russell westbrook has officially requested a trade but here's the kicker he would like to be traded to either the heat warriors or bucks <laughs> that that's like Amber Heard saying like, hey, I'm single now. So, you know, The Rock, Brad Pitt, Tom Brady, you know, let me know. I'm ready. You know, like what? <laughs> his list just cracked me the hell up, man. Um, and, and then one more bit of news that I wanted to acknowledge my guy, Mike Schmidt of ESPN, their draft analyst, dude. It's unfortunate for us that he's no longer going to be working for ESPN and doing the draft coverage because he, he was elite at it. I really liked his style and I respect him a lot, has become the assistant GM for the Portland Trail Blazers. I think it's a brilliant move by the, by the Blazers because you think about how much intel he has over the last, I don't know, five, six draft classes. He has like intimate detail, like where he's met with all these kids face to face. He's, he's tracked them since they were teenagers. So 
just in the sense of opponent scouting, he's worth his weight in gold. Never mind like drafting. When they face other teams, he's, he knows all these young players in and out, strengths and weaknesses. So I thought that was a slick, shrewd move from the Portland Trailblazers. I'll close out here with some more Warriors stuff here. There's been some other Warriors talk. I know people were talking about Draymond made headlines again, running his mouth. He said Steph was doubled seven times more than KD in the finals. Look, defenses prioritize Steph more. I don't know about like the trapping and doubling because Steph as a high ball handler coming off the high pick and rolls, it was much more apparent where there's times where KD would catch on the high elbow and the whole defense would shift towards him. So do you count that as a double or not? I don't know. But I think ultimately the point is teams were more afraid of Steph. Now I've heard the counter argument. Well, maybe it's because teams were like, hey, we could take Steph away. We can't do nothing with KD. Touche. You know, maybe, maybe, right? I think the argument that I would make is KD is a more consistent score, right? He's going to give you eight in the first, six in the second, you know, 10 in the third, right? He's just gonna, It's just a slow drip of, of constant offense where Steph, we know once he goes super scion, it's the biggest knockout punch in the, in the game, right? It, he's the Mike Tyson. He, it, he has a one hitter quitter. If Steph gets hot for six minutes, it can end the game. And so I think it's that fear level is why you saw teams prioritize Steph over Durant in most situations. Now, I saw a little quick, little interesting blurb that the Warriors quietly, they brought in a kid from, I think, San Francisco State, some local product, a point guard, right? But then along with him for the workout, they brought in this kid, Christian Coloco, seven-footer from U of A. What comes to your mind when you think of that, right? And you're like, oh, the Warriors are working out a a young seven-footer, Coloco, is he African? Maybe first, second generation. Does that possibly mean that they're going to be ready to move off James Wiseman? I don't know. I don't know. That's what came to my mind. I'm just like, oh, they're, they're quietly working out seven-footers in the draft? Okay. Okay. I just wanted to point that out. So I'm going to finish up speaking on Draymond and, and this media thing. And if you saw the clip I put out uh, yesterday of his, his defensive lapses in game one, the thumbnail said, say less. Colin Coward and his volume network is exploiting you, Draymond Green. They're exploiting you. Draymond thinks people care about what he has to say because he's like this brilliant basketball mind. When really, it's because he plays with Stefan for the Warriors. You think Draymond would have a popular podcast if he played for the Pistons his entire career? No, it's the access. He is, you know, the horse's mouth, pun intended, to the most popular basketball team in the world. And it's funny because when you think about great coaches, teams, and players throughout sports, Jordan, Brady, Belichick, Tiger, What do they all have in common besides their greatness? They say less. I'm not talking about in hindsight after the fact. But during the competition or before it, they say the least amount possible. Because they understood or understand the more you talk, the more info you give to your opponent. There is nothing Draymond can say on these podcasts that can help his team. All it can do is help the opponent. So Draymond, say less. This is high volume shooting. I'm out.